Hello, Shirley Adams to discuss some deep, dark mysteries. Unless it's obviously only one layer of fabric in a garment, other layers exist under it all. This is program number 10 of the Sewing Connection Series 2, and we're going to delve into the purposes and the how-to of interfacing, facing, underlining, interlining, and lining. Moving in from the outer layer, the fashion fabric, the next layer is the interfacing, and this is needed for support, reinforcement in areas like collars, cuffs, button and buttonholes, any place where you're going to have some construction details that need reinforcement. So in a suit, for instance, you'd have it all down the front here, you'd have it under the arm and across the back, any place there are going to be pockets, and there weren't any pockets in the one on the table, but here there are pockets. I want to make sure there's interfacing going under here to support those pockets. So it's for reinforcement and support, and you really need a good interfacing in those areas. Now, interfacing creates, I know, a lot of confusion because there are a uh, hundred or more on the market probably, and it's always, which one shall I use for what purpose, for which garment, for which fabric? So I'm going to just try to simplify it for you. If, for instance, uh, you are going to be doing a suit or a coat, anything tailored, anything heavier like this, you're going to need a substantial interfacing. So there are a couple of groups of them, and here are the differences. These two that I have here on top are just two different colors of the same thing, just two neutrals. But these interfacings are fusible. They're the new generation of interfacings. They work very well. If you will kind of feel layers in anything that you see commercially, if you will feel layers like this, you will notice that it's really put together, the outer layer, the fashion fabric, and whatever is supporting it. And what that probably means is that it's a fusible. Now, the other alternative is the one that always used to be used, and it still can be used. It still is fine, and that's this one down here. This is a hair canvas, so named because it does have some uh, goat hair content in it. And so it's very resilient. It's a great interfacing. But the problem with this is that most of us are so hurried and have so many demands on our time that it's hard to find enough time to do this because this is how you would use that uh, canvas, that hair canvas. This is an under collar. And these are pad stitches that I'm doing. They're little diagonal stitches, and there would be hundreds of them in a garment. So if you have time for those hundreds of little pad stitches in the collar, down the fronts, every place where they're needed, wonderful. This is a terrific interfacing, and go ahead and use it. It really is nice. You can mold it into shape. But if you need those shortcuts, that hurry-up type thing, then the fusibles might be for you. Here also with the fusibles, there are a couple of groups. Are you going to do uh, something tailored, something heavy, something that needs a lot of substance under it? Or are you going to do something lightweight, such as a blouse? Even a blouse needs some interfacing in it, and where the interfacing would be in this is just a little bit under the facing, inside the facing here. So it's always the layer that comes right next to the fashion layer, but it might be abbreviated for some of these garments. It might be maximized for others that really need the support. So uh, another way to simplify this, uh, what kind do you use for the lightweight things, the blouses, the dresses? You might try some of the knit trico types, even if it's a woven fabric, woven or knit. There are a whole lot of sheer ones uh, on the market. But you might try one of those wo or knit tricots and see what it does. It comes in several different weights. And if you aren't real pleased with that, then branch off into the other sheer ones because there are so many. But I find these to be so easily successful that uh, it's a good starting point. What I have down here at the bottom then of this little chart are some waistband interfacings that you saw me use in a previous show. And those are just to snap inside the waistband to keep it crisp. But again, it's for support, for extra firmness. That's the purpose of that interfacing, to give it body, to give it a bone structure. Picture your body without the bones, and you'd see a suit without interfacing. Uh, just nothing there to hold it up. So that interfacing has to be applied then after you have it uh, all purchased. And here I have some all cut out. And what I've done with this is cut out the entire front of this suit. And this suit pattern not only is the front here, but it also extends around to, and I'll turn it over here, 
so that you can see the labels a little bit more easily, perhaps. But here would be the side right here. So this extends a little bit into the back. Uh, but I want this whole front. Very often with the interfacing patterns, they give you one that just goes down the very front edge, the center front, and it's labeled the interfacing pattern. If it's going to be a suit or a coat, I don't use that. I use instead just the same pattern piece that I use to cut out the suit front, and I'm going to use it again then for the interfacing, because I want the maximum amount for a really well-tailored suit. Then after you have that all cut out, both in the fashion fabric, as I have here, as well as in the interfacing, as I have here, two layers of each, then it's a good idea to test it. And I've already tested this because this is the reason. The manufacturer recommends that you dip this in hot water, let it dry, and then uh, use it to pre-shrink it. You can't, of course, steam pre-shrink it with your iron. If you do that, you've got a new ironing board cover because it's fusible. It will stick to something, so you can't do that. But what I find is it's very rare that any shrinkage occurs as I'm doing this in water. Therefore, with this, I didn't even bother to pre-shrink it in the water. What I did instead is cut off a little piece. I have two pieces of wool here. I cut these three layers simultaneously so that I had the interfacing and the two wool layers. I kept this one wool layer as a control so that uh, I would know if I had any shrinkage or not. This other layer then, I fused the interfacing to, and then I compared the two, and I found no shrinkage whatsoever. So since this was the case, then it's completely safe for me to go ahead and fuse this front, and I won't find any shrinkage. If you have any doubts, test like this, and then you won't have a problem. Now to do this uh, interfacing, to get it um, all fused to the front, I'm just going to remove one piece here and put it out of the way. And I just need one layer of the wool. And of course, when you have this cut out, the wrong side is on the outside. The right sides are together of the wool. So I'm just going to take this top layer of the wool. This is the wrong side. This is the wrong side of the interfacing, and make sure that it is, because those little glue beads are all over the back of it, and you want to make sure that is against the fabric. Now, you can do this with an iron and a wet press cloth. If you have a press, this is a perfect place to use it, because we're going to have such a big area, this whole big front, and it would take a considerable amount of time if you do all this with the iron. Therefore, it's going to be kind of a good idea if you instead take it over to the press and put it on there so that you can get everything all straightened out. Now I am, and I was carrying it, I did uh, move it a little bit, so I'm straightening it out here again. And I'm going to put this on the press and get some pressing going here. You might put a few pins in just to make sure that nothing moves while you do this. Not where the uh, press will actually come down on it, but just around the outlying area. I'm going to put it down on the table here to get it just perfect, because I certainly would not want to have anything unfortunate happen, like having it in the wrong place. So I'm going to put it down here and put a couple of those pins in just so that it won't move, just so I won't make any errors. Anytime you do any sewing, there's no sense in gambling with silly things that could have been corrected if you just did it right in the first place. So with a couple of pins, I'll put one here just so that I can move it and then I'll take it out. I'm going to put this down on the press, and because this piece is so wide, because it comes around not only the front and part of the side, but even into the back of this jacket, I'm going to uh, put it sideways like this. Ordinarily, I'd put it lengthwise, but sideways because it is such a large piece. And then we're going to use heat and steam and pressure and time. All of those elements are very important. We need a proper heat setting, so I have it set on wool. We need to have, oh, probably about uh, 10 to 15 seconds. You would need a little bit more if you're doing this with an iron, but if you're doing it on a press, it takes less. You need also to have steam because moisture is very important to get all this fused together properly so that you won't have it bubble and come apart later. And the right amount of uh, pressure. Now, I don't have to worry about the pressure either here because it gives an enormous amount of pressure here. So I won't have to worry about that. What I am going to do, now I just have to turn this little handle and get steam, but I want this really well fused. I want the maximum amount of steam. Therefore, not only will I use the steam that is in the press, but I'm going to give this just a little bit more. I'm going to put a little bit of, with this mister, I'm going to put a little bit more moisture here. And then I'll pull down the press. 
and I'll give it a little more steam so that it really works and then you don't have to worry about it if you use the press. You don't have to count the seconds, watch a stopwatch or anything of that sort because it's going to do its own thing and it'll tell you when it's ready. So you lift it up and this is all beautifully fused. It will not come apart. And so after you finish that, then you just uh, move it to the next area and do the whole uh, jacket front that same way. So that doesn't take nearly as long if you have the capability of using a press as it would if you would use an iron. So do it the easy way whenever you can. When I get through with that piece, then of course I would do this piece and remember, of course, to turn the piece over so that you have the wrong side of the fabric here and so that the, uh, the business side, the glue side of the uh, fusible interfacing will be against it. Make sure you have that right. You don't want to end up with uh, two left fronts or something nasty of that sort. So that was the interfacing here and that's that ugly layer that is so necessary that's inside that jacket. Now here's another little bit of interfacing that I did on this uh, blouse that I showed you a little earlier. And with this interfacing, I said it was abbreviated. There's only a small amount here. It's only going to be up the front and around the neck. That's just to finish off the neck to give it a little crispness here. And it also is to give the reinforcement, of course, in the button, buttonhole area, so it needs to be down the front. So anyway, it's just small pieces that I need here. Well, where you have a problem with interfacing and facing on these small pieces, and by the way, facing is what this is being attached to, even though on the big project, the suit, the interfacing was being attached to the fashion fabric. Here on small projects, very often, you attach the interfacing to the facing. So that's what I have done on this. The interfacing is on the back side of the facing, and that's the only place it is. So where you have a problem then in cutting this out is that these are very thin, slippery fabrics. I've cut out the facing piece out of this silky fabric and out of the trico uh, fusible, I've cut out the interfacing piece because they're the very same pattern piece that you use for both of them. And then the problem is, even though you're very careful and cut right on the lines, to get them exactly the same is almost an impossibility. We are human, we have little quirks as we go through it with our scissors. So here would be the problem. As I try to get these together, they aren't quite the same. You can see the interfacing peeking out a little bit here and there. And so to make this job easy, I really don't do this if it's a small, silky project. I really don't cut out the facing in advance. I instead just use that pattern to cut out the interfacing only. I put the interfacing down on some uncut fabric, fuse it so that it's all together, and then simply cut around that. And that sure is a time saver. It uh, saves a lot of the bother of thinking, oh, I got that gooey stuff on my iron or my ironing board. It's just easier that way, so it's a good direction to go. So that's the, the interfacing and the facing. Now we're also going to see some facing in suits, of course. Here we have it in the back, and we have it on the inside here of the uh, front. So facings are in everything. They finish off edges is what they do. Then the third thing that I have down here is interlining. And interlining you don't have to worry about unless you're making a heavy winter coat, so I'm not even going to show you any examples. If you look inside a commercial coat, uh, look inside the lining, and that interlining is that ugly stuff that you see there in the middle. Uh, looks like real strange wool. You don't need to care. You aren't going to use it probably, or at least not very often. Winter coats would be the only instance when you'd use an interlining. Uh, an underlining is another term, and this we don't use real frequently, but let me show you a couple of examples here where I did use it. I think I just uh, showed this particular blouse on the last uh, program or so. But this is all underlined, and the reason for that is this needed some beefing up. This is very, very fine, thin fabric. It's a sheer fabric. It needed a little beefing up. So here's the underlining, this white, this uh, crisp, uh, thin white fabric I'm pulling up, I have used as the underlining. And notice at the seams that before I started constructing this, I had already put the underlining and the fashion fabric, the flowered fabric here, I had already stay stitched around those pieces together so that they acted as one piece of fabric after I had them stay stitched. And then as I constructed them, I didn't even worry about having two layers of fabric. They were both there. 
you would only use this on any fabric that needs beefing up a little bit all over. Now I have done a strange combination in something else here that I'll show you. This is actually interfacing fabric. This is that fusible trico. But I have used this not only in the usual interfaced places, I have used this all over as an underlining in this. So it's actually interfacing fabric, but it's used as an underlining so that it beefs this uh, fabric up. This is really very thin fabric, but by beefing it up with that underlining, it really makes it look like leather and you have to feel it to see, is that leather or is it not? So it really does change the character of the fabric. So you sometimes use some of these products in unusual ways. Okay, so that was the underlining layer. Then we have a lining layer next. And this lining layer is just really important because obviously what it's going to do is cover up all the uglies. We don't want to open a jacket and see it looking like this. Gracious, you'd never take a jacket off if that's the way it looked. We instead want to open up that jacket and have it looking wonderful. So a lining is, for one thing, to cover up the uglies. It looks a lot prettier with this in. For that reason, you want to have something that's opaque for a lining. There are some uh, linings that the fabric looks pretty, but uh, you can see right through it. You can read the label through this. And if that's the case, then you aren't going to be too thrilled with that inside your jacket because it actually is going to show all the ugly things that you want to cover up. So opaque is one quality you want your lining to have. Another quality you want it to have is slippery. Uh, you need to slide this on and off your body easily because it's quite annoying if you have a jacket that doesn't slide on and off. Everything feels tight. Just when you move forward, you can't move very easily because the lining isn't sliding. And it's especially difficult then to remove it or put it back on and have it cling to sweaters or whatever you have under it. So one time I made a suit with this and I just keep this sample around to show me don't do it again. It's a lovely fabric. It would make a very pretty blouse, but it was a complete failure inside that suit because it wouldn't slide on and off at all. And it was very annoying and the suit always felt like it was too tight for me. Like I had made it too small because it didn't slip. So any of these that are on this side of this little chart are opaque, they are slippery, they may be found in the lining department, then again they may be found in the blouse or dress fabric department. Wherever you can find the best color match, and it doesn't have to match completely, it can be a contrast if you want, but whatever you find to your liking. It can also, if you feel so inclined, be a print instead of a, a solid. So whatever suits your needs the best. You're the designer when you sew, you do what you please there, but make it opaque and make it slippery and you'll be very pleased with the result. Well, then comes the matter of cutting out that lining. And here we have a little suit jacket. I have half size here so that you can see it all more easily. And here's what you need to cut out for the lining. Now, sometimes you have a lining pattern included in your pattern envelope. And uh, I found that it doesn't always work as well as it should. Sometimes it short changes the length a little bit. Here's what I'm talking about. In this suit, I want down at the bottom of it, both at the lower edge here and also inside the sleeves, I want to have this ease pleat. I want to have extra fabric there. I don't want it to pull tightly because if that pulls tightly, here for instance is what a sleeve would look like if that lining pulls up too short. And you've seen this hanging on the rack in stores. You've seen sleeves that look kind of like this. Well, the reason they look like that is because the lining is too short. So be sure if you do use the pattern that's included in the envelope, be sure you check to make sure that it's long enough that it comes about a half inch beyond the finished length of your jacket is where it should come. So be sure you have enough. Other patterns don't even include a lining pattern. So let me just tell you whether it has a pattern or whether it does not. Let me just show you how you can cut it out easily on your own without even using that. Okay, here I have the pieces that would be with this suit jacket. There's a, a front and there's a side front, just as there is in this suit jacket, a front and a side front. Same thing here. Then there's a back and a side back. Some of them just have one piece backs and one piece fronts, but this one has four pieces going around the body. Then this also has an upper and an under sleeve. Some sleeves just have one piece. Uh, this one has two. So whatever. 
here is the way you can cut it out so it fits perfectly so we'll, you'll have no slip ups so that everything works out fine. You first of all put your facing down on it because what a lining is is the entire jacket minus the facings whether it's front facing or back facing it's the jacket minus the facing plus two seam allowances okay because we need to have one seam allowance if I pull the wait the lining back here that I have I can show you that on here I have lining and facing attached together for that pink leather jacket and you can see that the body of the jacket is there in the lining uh, minus the facing but then I need over here two seam allowances so that's five eighths of an inch for each of those seam allowances is what I need therefore when I put this facing down on my whole pattern front I'm going to mark a line here now what I've done here is mark a dotted line with a pen right where the edge of the lining comes and then, or right where the edge of the facing comes I'm sorry and then after I have this then I'm going to have to add to this two seam allowances one for the lining and one for the facing so beyond this line beyond that edge where the front facing goes down I need an extra inch and a quarter beyond that now remember this is half size so instead of an inch and a quarter I only have five eighths here which would be half that inch and a quarter is five eighths plus five eighths the two seam allowances makes an inch and a quarter so that's why where the edge of the facing is plus an inch and a quarter this red line then that I have marked right here is actually where I would cut out this lining and usually how I do this is to cut out the whole lining and notice how I have pins all along in this area where I drew that line that was the edge of the facing after I have everything else cut out I then just lift this up and with this folded out of the way I can take a little hem gauge and just measure over here an inch and a quarter and do my cutting an inch and a quarter beyond this all the way down so you find the easy way for you but that's the way I find it easy then there are some additional things that you want to do to this lining before you cut it out to make sure that it works just right I'll get that one out of the way anytime in the back of your jacket and let's get this one down maybe you can see in here better I'll put this one back up out of the way um, in the back of this jacket there needs to be an ease pleat and that's what this is we have an ease pleat right here and the reason for that is when you reach forward you know how it can strain and if there's any strain at all it's not going to be on your sturdy jacket fabric it's going to be on the lining which is a weaker fabric and it's going to rip out right around the sleeves here isn't it you've had that happen so to prevent that always have an ease plate there at the center back so that this will never happen to you as long as it's a fitted jacket we wouldn't need it if it would be a big oversized jacket but that ease plate I've allowed for here here is my pattern back and what the red line is coming out here beyond the actual pattern is that ease plate that you need out and back and it's usually about oh just an inch will do it you don't stretch any more than that and you only need this in the shoulder area where your arms reach forward some patterns have it all the way down to the bottom I assure you even if you sit or bend over or whatever you don't need the ease plate down here in your hips and waist area you only need it at your shoulders so that's why this one I have tapered down at the waist to nothing I only have it up here in the shoulder area then here again I have subtracted the facing plus the two seam allowances so here's where I would cut it out I also at the bottom of these pieces have cut them out a half inch longer than the finished length of the jacket they don't need to be as long but there's nothing lost if you go ahead and cut the full length you can trim it off later then additionally right now these days what we need to consider is shoulder pads remember that the outside fabric the fashion fabric goes over the shoulder pad it's on the outside here but this lining on the inside goes under the shoulder pad so you don't want as much height there on the shoulders and the same is true as of the sleeve cap because this sleeve cap comes up to the top of the shoulder pad and meets it there you need that extra height on the inside though that lining comes on the other side of the shoulder pad close to your body so you don't need the height there so additionally to everything else I've said notice my other little red lines here I've eliminated whatever is the height of this pad and put a pin through to check it I'm putting it through until I touch my finger on the other side and then I'll pull it out and measure and I can see this pad is a half inch
So with that half inch pad, that means that I want to subtract a half an inch on the bodice front and back and on the sleeve cap. I want to subtract a half inch, but don't fold the whole thing down. Not at your neck, because remember at your neck there is no padding. The padding's all out here. So you taper that to a half inch lower, only out at the shoulder points, and taper it around the top of the sleeve cap from notch to notch. So our time has about run out, but we still need to put this together. We need to cut it out, put it together, press it, insert it in the jacket, and finish up. So come join me next time to see how easily it all happens.